Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. I think we have to have a theme today. What are they thinking? WTF. I'm really trying to figure this out. I really am trying to figure out what is Mitch McConnell thinking about bringing the nation to uh, the brink of a financial crisis? What are Democrats in the House thinking about doing? Saying that, uh, hey, I have a pony, but I'm going to kill the pony unless I also get a unicorn. Um, what is what is Donald Trump thinking? Although I think we, we kind of, of know that. And um, so anyway, good morning, A.B. Stoddard, to help me out with all of this stuff. Because I figured you're way smarter than I am about these sorts of things. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no. I'm as confused and bewildered and depressed as you and happy to be with you, Charlie. Confused, bewildered, and depressed. Boy, <laughs> now there's a way of starting off the day. So for everybody listening to the podcast, beginning their workout, that's going to be one of the themes. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on this theme of what are they thinking, because I, I don't know that you've seen it. And we have so many other things happening. It's not exactly a slow news day. but I guess this is why I'm asking, what were they thinking in the New York Times newsroom, given the everything's on fire, everything's burning, and they decide to devote a, a feature to what if we redesigned the American flag? What if we updated it? I, you, you need to see these things, A.B. I mean, you need to, I, I, I can't do justice to it on the podcast, but let me just, the, the short version of this is, they are all uniformly ghastly. <laughs> I mean, they are ugly. They are terrible. And unless they were thinking, hey, we need to come up with a way to give Fox News hosts more material. I just don't know <laughs> what they're doing. I mean, I don't know how Fox News is not going wall to wall with saying, see, these people, they hate America. They hate the American flag. Look at what they are proposing. I mean, yeah. and just, it's so just, wonderful. It, it kind of it should be paired with uh, Terry McAuliffe in the debate last night saying parents should just butt out of what's being taught in schools. Um, this is what's known as an unforced Fox error. News, a big day today. Yeah, th this would this this would be the the unforced error. So let's start with let's start with uh, the, the the big hearing yesterday, the the general's hearing, um, which which I thought was actually kind of interesting. I mean, yes, there was the usual, you know, performative jerkitude from, from certain <laughs> folks, but um, we did get some, I thought, some good answers. I, I thought it was was refreshing that that uh, General Mark Milley's admitted that this was a strategic failure. I mean, to hear the general say, yeah, it was a, it was a failure after 20 years of happy talk and, and misleading uh, and, and, and misleading information. What was what was your take from the hearing? Well, I, I felt the same way that I was glad that they were frank about in their assessment uh, of it. Uh, it is hard to say it was an operational success and a strategic failure or mistake or whatever that dance was. But all in all, to see them um, be willing to say that they made a different recommendation to the president than the one that he um, pursued, I, I, I was just relieved about that because I think that we want to know that they're, you know, willing to, in this administration, tell the truth, um, no matter where it, it leads. Um, I thought that Millie was obviously, he was sort of, you know, the big attraction of the hearing because of the revelations in, in Robert uh, yeah. Costa and Bob Woodward's book. And he was well prepared for that. Um, there was obviously much more he could have said if he was not in in the role that he's in. I mean, you could tell um, what he might have said to Tom Cotton in private. Also, you know, a, 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 a service member uh, at one I'm point. I'm going to get to Tom. Um, but but I thought that um, I thought that it was it was Afghanistan is painful, and there's no way to um, to spin it in black or white. And so yeah. the, I think it's better that we continue. To, to concede to the gray, um, both Biden and Trump have sold the American public on the withdrawal policy. And so we're really going to have a better sense, yeah. I think, months from now, uh, what everyone thinks uh, about, about Afghanistan. Uh, sadly, I'm with the crowd that believes it will become, you know, a terrorist haven and, and we'll have regrets in a year and a half. But that's um, not what this is all about. Well, it was not a good day either for for Joe Biden or for for Donald Trump. I mean, Donald Trump's got uh, the the history, including the fact that he was the one who surrendered to the Taliban um, a year ago. And you had the generals talk about that Doha agreement being incredibly demoralizing. And then, of course, the generals seem to flatly contradict uh, Biden, saying that nobody had recommended leaving troops there. 
But I have to tell you, I, I, this, this did kick in my, my deep cynicism. Um, you know, I, I do struggle against cynicism. You may have noticed this. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm watching all of this, you know, the, the fury and the performance of the Republican senators and some of the defensiveness of the Democrats, at least some of the Democrats. And I was, it, it's hard not to imagine how their, their you know, posturing would have been completely inverted and reversed if Trump, rather than Biden, had presided over the fiasco. I mean, you know, the, the same set of facts. You know that Tom Cotton would have been out there defending what what was done, and they would have been beating their breasts. And so, and, you know, and this is this is part of the you know pick pick which side you're on, and you can reverse them. But I will say, I will say this though, and I want to play for you a soundbite because I think this was this was the one that I found the most riveting. I, I, I think that you could even consider these hearings to be kind of a masterclass in civilian military relations. Yes. Um, you know, who's in charge? And, yeah. uh, you know, Tom Cotton was in full performative mode. And I think he thought he had this big gotcha question for General Milley um, when, and again, Cotton had, you know, it's previously served in the U.S. Army. And he, he demands to know why General Milley had not resigned after his recommendations were rejected. It was very clear, Milley and the other generals had said that they had recommended keeping troops in Afghanistan and that the president had made his own decision, which was his right. And Cotton, you know, demands what to know why he, you know, did not uh, quit on on the spot. Let, let's play the soundbite because this ought to be this ought to be played in the War College um, on a loop in the future. Let's play it, General Milley. I can only conclude that your advice about staying in Afghanistan was rejected. I'm shocked to learn that your advice wasn't sought until August 25th on staying past the August 31 deadline. I understand that you're the principal military advisor, that you advise, you don't decide, the president decides. But if all this is true, General Milley, why haven't you resigned? Senator, as a senior here, military officer, here it comes. Um, resigning is a really serious thing, and it's a political act if I'm resigning in protest. My job is to provide advice. My statutory responsibility is to provide legal advice or best military advice to the president. And that's my legal requirement. That's what the law is. Um, the president doesn't have to agree with that advice. He doesn't have to make those decisions uh, just because we're generals. And it would be an incredible act of political defiance for a commissioned officer to just resign because my advice is not taken. This country doesn't want generals figuring out what orders we are going to no, accept and do or not. That's not our job. Mm -hmm. The principle of civilian control in the military is absolute. It's critical to this republic. In addition to that, just from a personal standpoint, you know, my, my dad didn't get a choice to resign at Iwo Jima. Mm. And those kids that are at Abbey Gate, they don't get a choice to resign. And I'm not going to turn my back on them. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to resign. They can't resign, so I'm not going to resign. There's no way. Uh, if the orders are illegal, we're in a different place. But if the orders are legal from civilian authority, I intend to carry them out. So is Tom Cotton still stuffed in the locker? <laughs> I mean, that was, he just schooled him on that, didn't he? It, it, it was amazing because obviously what he said at the end about his father was so deeply compelling and, 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 you know, the men and women serving now, um, really, really compelling. Uh, but, but also on substance, he's just right. He's correct. And he corrected, uh, cotton. And, um, what's interesting is, is thinking back to, to Mattis, Charlie, because yeah. we, you know, we, we, we lauded him for standing up and walking away, even though we didn't want him to leave his job. Um, when Trump, you know, abandoned the Kurds in, in Syria. Uh, and although there are a few voices at the time um, who agreed, um, we, we actually know that, you know, people like Monk, Mike Pompeo agreed with Mattis. Uh, Lindsey Graham was louder about it than he was. But Mattis um, was in know, a pol political position. Basically, the that Republican point. Party of Trump was not, you know, was, was not urging, um, you know, it, it, they, they, they had a different take of this whole process back then. And it's, it's just an interesting, um, they were mad. They, they didn't want the embarrassment of Mattis resigning. So yeah. it's, it's just been a, it's been a really interesting, um, uh, trip down the rabbit hole, looking back, um, uh, listening to them describe just how much, uh, Pompeo and Trump's deal just disemboweled, you know, this government that we spent years 
an American blood and treasure um, building up. Uh, it's 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 a tragedy on so many levels, but um, I was really glad to see not only uh, that Millie stood up for those principles of the way the system works, um, uh, but really, you know, talked about his dad and put Cotton right back on his kindergarten chair. Well, and, and these are all things that Tom Cotton certainly sh- sh- should have known. Okay, so speaking of, you, you mentioned uh, Mattis and, and a number of others, and this, this, this may seem like a, a slight digression, but and I, w- I was thinking about the Stephanie Grisham book uh, that came out where she has all of these revelations. Well, now you can ask me questions or whatever the hell it is. I'm not reading the book, but it's like, you know, JVL made this point yesterday, and I think it's a legitimate one. Why didn't they speak out oh. earlier? I mean, it's not just, I mean, it's good, fine, that they, they say, you know, but you had all of these folks that knew what Donald Trump was like, what he was doing, the way he was fawning on Russia, how utterly unfit he was in temperament to be president. But we didn't hear from Mike Pompeo. We didn't hear from Mattis. We didn't hear from General McMaster. We didn't hear from John Kelly. We didn't hear from Mick Mulvaney. We didn't hear from, I mean, just make a long list of people who could have spoken out, you know, when everything was, was on the line, John Bolton, and yet they didn't. So, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm glad that we're learning more things, but I still have a problem with this. Uh, okay. So let's start on a light note, which, mm. which is that I am simply, un, I'm unable to read about the revelations in the Grisham book after learning last night that in the middle of his sociopathic rages, there was a, quote, music man running around after the very stable genius to play. <laughs> To play him the theme song from Cats <laughs> to soothe Memories. him. I cannot unknow this. I cannot unhear it. I cannot unsee it. I, 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 I think <laughs> that we ought to get the word out to MAGA world that, that <laughs> right? Donald Trump is a big Cats fan. Yes. Seriously. Exactly. exactly. The macho MAGA members need to ingest the fact that he has a fetish for Tiny Dancer and Memory. <laughs> But these are like the top songs um, in his. Uh, so th- this, this in fact, is what may have saved the, the republic. <laughs> we, Jonathan, could you just drop in a little bit of, just drop in a little bit of memory? memory I, I want people to understand the, the significance of this is that, <laughs> is that in the White House, they, they, they felt the need to manage his uncontrollable rages to the point where <laughs> someone was assigned to, I don't know, stand in the Oval Office and um, memories <laughs> or what like pipe it Busted into from their the iPhone. residence <laughs> and is it is it clear I, i'm not sure if it's clear in the book whether in fact it worked you know that i mean who knows i mean maybe we would have nuked iran if somebody well, hadn't played some show tunes for for the president <laughs> I'm, yeah that's that's exactly what i was thinking it was that it, it wasn't just that he saved the republic music man but maybe the entire globe um we don't know uh, I'm, how, I'm, how I'm far. Grateful. It, I'm, I'm grateful for that. How far it got, um, but yeah, I. So I wanted to chuckle about that, but I, I'm with JVL, and you know, Bill has touched on this before, before the election, and and after. I mean, Chris Christie is trying to write a book and run for president and tell the party to oh, leave no. behind. You're, you're, you know, you're their push, Trump you're, fetish. You're pushing my buttons here. I mean, all no, of the people you just mentioned, Bolton, Kelly, um, you know, McConnell now knows. Uh, I, I was hoping, I mean, I really give my, I, I take off my hat to, to Colin Powell and William Cohen and people who stood up and said, a second term is unacceptable. It will break us. But no one else did, these people that knew. And, yeah. you know, if you think about the Kagan piece and, and, the, and the serious Kagan. dire yeah. danger that we're in, are they going to step up now? I mean, Kagan is asking Romney and and Cheney and Kinzinger to be constitutional Republicans and try to come in and save yeah. the system, but from the Congress. But you know, I fantasized for four years about this cabal of the righteous. You know, that Bob Gates and Henry Kissinger and yeah. you know, all, and and Jeb and and you were there being fantasized. They would all come out and say, you know, we we have to save this country. Nobody did. They knew how dangerous a second term would be. They, they I don't care if Jeb wrote in, you know, uh, Michelle Obama. He right. he was worried about his son's political future. He did not step up and say something last October. 
And, yeah. and, and same with, you know, John Kelly, who is really um, up close to this. It, it's just infuriating. And I, 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 you know, it's really on them. They're so complicit in all the danger that that we're in right now and that is growing um, with each passing month because Donald Trump can win the next election legitimately. He absolutely he can. can. Yep. Yes, or illegitimately, but uh, right, he's, he's running and he's going to be the nominee. And the same people that did nothing to stop him will do nothing to stop him this time. Uh, you right. know that the anti-anti-Trumpers who, who were all the columns about, well, we wrote in Edmund Burke, and yes, maybe he should have been impeached. They'll talk themselves into not being anti-Trump again. And, and so I have mixed feelings about the Chris Christie's of the world. I mean, I'm glad that he's speaking out now. Um, maybe in 2024, uh, we're going to need them as allies, and this is a good thing, so I'm prepared to listen. But I'm only prepared to listen, and I've said this before, after I've sat down with Chris Christie and said, um, Governor, what the fuck were you thinking? When you were standing behind there staring, you know, at, at, at Donald Trump and endorsing him, what the fuck were you thinking was going to happen to the country? Um, and, you know, how did you stay silent for all that time? I mean, let, let, let's have that conversation. OK, so we've, we've dropped our first step. I, I agree. But, but Charlie, I just want to quickly uh, you're you had you had a great interview with Lieutenant Governor of Georgia, Jeff Duncan, and you and you really stood you know, you stayed on on course and you kept trying to bring him back from, you know, attitude and approach and tone and style and empathy and everything. You know, Chris Christie and Duncan and these people they are going to try to step into the Cheney, yeah. you know, Kinzinger, Larry Hogan world. Are they going to actually say that the con that the constitutional order is under threat or are they going to say what Duncan said, which was it's just going to be cool again to be a rock star conservative? Yeah. I mean, look, I, I, I appreciate what Jeff Duncan has done down in Georgia, but um, it struck me that he's still in denial. I, I think it's sort of like the stages of grief where you go, yeah. OK, this is a one time thing. It'll, it'll it'll get better really, really soon. And then yeah. you have to sort of realize that what is it, negotiation, grief, acceptance? I don't know. He's still <laughs> he's still in that first phase. Because, I mean, part of the the recognition is it's not just about tone. It's not just about the tweets. There's something fundamentally going on among conservatives. So do you want your daily dose of J.D. Vance? Yes, of course. No one wants, no, no one wants <laughs> their daily dose of J.D. Vance. Okay, but this is this is one of those moments where you go, okay, something rather radical has happened to conservatives because um, he, like, I, I'm just, I'm just going to play this. So he, he's on he's on with Tucker Carlson last night, J.D. Vance, of course, um, best-selling author of, uh, of, of whatever the book was. And now I'm it's just... Um, running for the Senate uh, in this sort of race to the bottom uh, in, o in Ohio. And he's on with Tucker Carlson talking about how the government should punish progressive left-leaning private foundations. I can't summarize it any better than actually just playing a very short clip. So here it goes. At the end of the day, why are we allowing the companies, the foundations that are destroying this country allowing. to receive tax tax preferences? Why don't we seize the assets of the Ford Foundation, tax yeah. their assets and give it to the people who have had their lives destroyed by their radical open borders agenda? Give it to the people whose lives have been destroyed by the heroin epidemic. Give it to the angel moms who have lost a kid thanks to the Ford Foundation's ideas. This is what conservatives we need to wake up what? about. The left is completely controlling our society through these institutions, if we don't fight back against them, they're going to make this country not a good place to live. Amen. Hey, oh, thank you. Hey, OK, so A.B. smells like socialism to me. I, I was seize what? their assets and uh -huh. give them to the people. I mean, Bernie Sanders would 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 blush to say something like that. I, I was that's what I was just I was going to ask if he had been listening some Bernie Sanders. Um, this is more uh, Che. This is more che, this is more Che Guevara. Yeah, this is this is incredible. He must have some new polling from, you know, his place in the race behind Josh Mandel or something. This is desperate. I mean, he's been acting very strangely and the guy is a mess, Vance. But but he's th th seize, this kind of thing. Seize I mean, them and, and tax the assets. I, I, I'm, I'm getting the sense he hasn't really thought this through. You seize the assets and then you tax them or you <laughs> tax them in order to destroy. I mean, yeah, you know. It doesn't matter. Just yeah. you, you know that we that, hate they, that the he knows the crowd will eat it up. It doesn't have to make sense. Seize the oil. Say whatever you're going to say. Yeah. Tucker doesn't inject and say this sounds like socialism to me. The whole thing is madness. This is like when um, 
you know, Ch- Trump was sending boycott tweets about the Harley Davidson company. I mean, which to, is located to boycott here. them. I mean, just please, everyone, I've said it before, just imagine what would have happened to Barack Obama if he had they, called for a boycott of the Harley Davidson company. Oh, I, I'm just trying to imagine, you know, if Barack Obama or, or Joe Biden or Kamala Harris had, had gone on MSNBC and said, yes, we need to seize the assets so that we can destroy <laughs> the Heritage Foundation or <laughs> seize the assets of evangelical Christian organizations because uh-huh. they're so terrible. But I mean, this is, again, it, it's all part of the, the tribal signaling of J.E. Vance that, you know, these people are evil. They're, they will want to destroy you. These are the kind of people that want to redesign the American flag. <laughs> and therefore, we <laughs> yeah. need to we, we we need to fight back against them. Okay, so let's let's move on to the next phase of the what are they thinking? Um, I wrote yesterday about the game of political chicken that's going on in Washington D.C., which I find extraordinary. Uh, in the Senate, you had the Democrats playing game of political chicken with the full faith and credit of the United States. In the House, it appears the Progressive Caucus is uh, dead set um, uh, on, is determined to kill a major portion of the Biden domestic agenda in order to save the Biden domestic agenda. I'm getting all these emails saying, Charlie, you don't understand. The reason they're going to vote against the Biden domestic agenda is because they need to save the Biden and domestic agenda. I think I've heard this before. So um, let, let's, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, I want to get your sense of what they're actually thinking. If you're a fan of this podcast or any of our other podcasts here at The Bulwark, I really think you're going to enjoy our newest edition. It's called The Focus Group, and it's hosted by our own Sarah Longwell. Maybe you've heard Sarah talk about these focus groups that she conducts, but now she's actually sharing real audio from the participants. It's a great show, and I know you're going to love it. Again, it's called The Focus Group with Sarah Longwell, and you can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else you consume podcasts. All right, we are back with A.B. Stoddard. Okay, help me out here. Got to help me out here. So, Charlie, I don't know how you tank yeah. the Biden agenda to save the Biden agenda, with all respect I don't, to I don't read now readers. Yeah. But I, I think that um, as far as the game of chicken, it's on the def- on debt ceiling and default. Yeah. It's very clear that the Democrats, the, Mitch McConnell knows the Democrats are the chickens and will swerve at the last minute because – they are in charge of the government and they're not right. going to but take how? us to default. I, see, this is this is what I'm trying to figure out. Say, okay, so if you figure that Mitch McConnell is kind of a nihilist about this. He, he knows you have to raise the debt limit. He says, I'm just not going to help you. He says, I know you need to do this. Otherwise, it's a, cata- it's a cataclysm. But hey, that's on you. Okay, fine. What are the Democrats going to do? They can't use reconciliation. Um, they tried to have a motion to have the debt ceiling raised by unanimous consent. What what what's left? How's this going to end? I, well, I I mean I, I'm not the one who can say how it's going to end. Nancy Pelosi knows how how it's going to end. But what you know, no, the no, idea, in the Senate, but, in, the, well, in the Senate I, I on the know, death I, mean, I don't know why Schumer said it, it, that it's non-starter to put on reconciliation. That's yeah. that's the path that they have, and I I, I imagine he'll have to eat his words. They're not going to to take us to default. They're not going to breach the debt ceiling and the debt limit. And so they're going to take care of that. It's the mess of the two packages that they have to deal with. Okay. Um, and the rest is this this debt stuff is a performance, right? They want to keep bringing things up for a vote so that they hope there are headlines about how Republicans are trying to drive us to default. And that's performative. And they hope that that is breaking through with the public. And I believe it is not at all. It is not. It um, is not. So I think Mitch, it, McCon- Mitch McConnell thinks that if you create enough chaos – that that will hurt the the Democrats and, and Joe Biden. So chaos really is the Republicans' friend. And and if this means tanking the stock market or rile, roiling the, the, the bond market, hey, fine. Then you can say, look, everything's turning to shit. The border's turning to shit. Afghanistan's turning to shit. Your 401k is turning to shit, you know? And yeah. then, of course, we have, you know, the, the orange guy emerging saying, miss me yet. Absolutely. McConnell doesn't care about being called a hypocrite. He embraces it. It's all about raw power to him and winning. He is standing there chuckling, saying, I am the minority leader. And you guys in the majority in the House and the majority in the Senate and you have the White House are going to blame me for the for like the, bringing us to the brink of default. 
that's just nothing but a laugh to him. And so, the, you know, the, the, this idea that Democrats are going to waste more time to try to show that Republicans are dangerous hypocrites, it's fine. They, they can do it. But I think it, it, they're losing time and effort um, and energy and resources that should be required to sort of patch up the other big problems with the two packages, which I also think ultimately will both pass because it's existential and they can't end up with nothing. So I, I, well, I, really, I, I don't see that this is all going to blow up. I think we don't know the specific path. But I think that um, the White House is going to talk Joe Manchin and and Cinema Kirsten Cinema into some some kind of modified package. It's likely going to be two trillion or maybe a little bit less, and it will likely be a a, a mishmash of longer term funding for universal benefits and then those little cliffs that the progressives want so they can say that every single program ever um, with, you know, all the rainbow and unicorn programs are all being funded and it's going to be super, right. even though they'll only be sh- funded for a short term. That That's, I think, where where the compromise is going to come. I don't know that we won't blow, blow past the Thursday deadline for the infrastructure vote. Um, there could be a short term patch for the expiring transportation funding that ends Thursday. Um, I, so I don't know th- what the, what the path is. I just know that in the end, um, I do believe that they're not going to tank a bipartisan infrastructure bill that 70% of the country approves yeah. of 19 Republicans voted for in the Senate Biden's poll numbers and the Democrats standing in the campaign next year do not permit them to end up with nothing. So could I point out the flaw in your reasoning, AB? Yeah. You're assuming that everybody will behave like a rational actor. (laughs) You're assuming that at the end of the day, they will be rational players who will be acting in quasi good faith. And I don't know, that's kind of seems so last decade. (laughs) You're right. I mean, Bernie Sanders is now going back. He's played an adult in the room for months now, and he's now throwing his popsicle sticks across the room and telling you it out. I, I strongly urge my house colleagues to vote against the bipartisan infrastructure bill yeah. until Congress passes a strong reconciliation bill. In other words, I strongly urge my house colleagues to vote against the bill that I voted for. Yes. So we're in a strange, strange world here. But remember he's in a, I think it's Monday nights. He's in a weekly leadership meeting with Mansion with Schumer. They, there's a lot of performance going on. Remember, they let Bernie go on his taxpayer-funded trips around red states trying to sell this. You know, he's been like a serious, you know, leader in this effort, budget committee chairman and everything. But but in the end, he always knew where this was going to go. So they're letting him do a lot of show. But he knows the math. They all know the math. I mean, you don't get past the math in the Senate and Joe Manchin. So what do you, you know, really, it's the, just a choice. Do you want to end up with nothing or do you just want to end up passing something that you can right. try to pretend is great and then, and then it, you know, be in closed doors, you can hate each other? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 that would be the reasonable, logical outcome from all of this. But, you know, this is, and the reason why I keep referring to this is the game of chicken. I mean, in the game of chicken, everybody assumes that in the end, somebody's going to swerve. But the problem is there's always that possibility that nobody swerves and yeah. everybody dies in this fiery crash. And we <laughs> live, you know, in with months of punditry about a failed presidency. I mean, that that's that's the problem of of that particular this particular strategy. Um, and, and, and and I also just noticed that the you know, the, the sort of the egging on of people, you know, stand firm, stand firm by voting against your own bill. I'm just trying to think of an analogy when this happened before. I mean, it, nothing's a- actually completely new, right? But can you remember when a major political part, a, a faction of a major political party threatened to vote against their own agenda? I mean, things no, they'd already no. voted for, you know, we're, we're going to kill, we're going to kill the pony if we don't get the unicorn thing. A, a bird in hand that is ready for a signing ceremony that is popular with 70% of the American people that allows Democrats to say they worked with Republicans. Is Joe Biden being aggressive enough in pushing this? I, I mean, the, there, the there was... There was the problem there was a, there is there's a, a bunch of complaints yeah. from the Democrats in Congress that he yeah. has not been involved enough and yeah. he has to step up his yeah. engagement. And there's a lot of complaining about that. So... I guess not. I guess it's been, you know, upper level staff. Um, 
Well, it, 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 it occurred to me that, you know, back in the heady days before, you know, a lot of things turned, there were comparisons of, uh, of Joe Biden to, to FDR and LBJ that he wanted to be a transformational president. Well, here's the thing about FDR and LBJ. They wouldn't put up with this kind of shit, would they? I mean, <laughs> LBJ would not be sitting back saying, tell me your feelings. Now, that's, that's unfair. I, I apologize. I don't, I don't know what's going on, but the reports you're getting out of the White House don't suggest that he's knocking heads together. Exactly. And um, you just have to listen to the comments from Senator Manchin. Every time he leaves, he says, we just talked about, you know, our general positions in the direction of the country. <laughs> he always says something sort of just sort of insultingly, you know, bland um, to, to, to make it sound like the meeting didn't really even happen. You know, it's, it's so bizarre. And it's so intentional. Oh, yeah, I, um, yeah. But I, but I, I, I do think that the other problem is that 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 Joe Biden doesn't have the margins that presidents who were able to transform well, exactly. did, and that's that's where that's where you know the rub is is that you you can't have a New Deal 2.0 with these margins. That should that should have been somewhat more evident earlier in the year. Okay, here's, here's something I wanted to to, to ask you about though. I'm noticing a lot of uh, Twitter hate for 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 uh, Kirsten Cinema and of course for Joe Manchin, but actually kind of pretty much more for Kirsten Cinema right now because she's considered to be the holdout. But is, is this somewhat misleading? Because are they kind of taking some bullets for other moderates in the Senate and in the House in particular who have been keeping their heads down? I mean, it's not totally clear to me that uh, the Nancy Pelosi has the votes of House moderates, the people who are the most vulnerable in the midterms, that, that she has them in the pocket for a three and a half trillion dollar reconciliation bill. Oh, yeah. So um, on the Senate side, uh, um, I am told that there are probably half a dozen senators who are as worried and are glad that they have the cover of uh, cinema and mansion and some there believe that cinema is being unfairly uh, criticized in the press as, um, you know, being elusive and not, and being vague and not being specific. And apparently she is very, very involved, very methodical uh, and, 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 and very engaged. And so it's, it's, it, it, it's sort of, um, it's sort of interesting to their colleagues that that he that Joe Manchin doesn't get attacked, but she does. I mean, they both do by progressives, but that the press sort of focuses is more on her as this enigma who is right. maybe throwing well, you know throwing uh, uh, throwing this all to pieces, and and that Joe Manchin's the friendly negotiator. I, I do think that on I know on the House side, uh, it's just very hard for yeah. um, swing district Democrats who are holding on for dear life to, they don't, they don't want to be seen as criticizing progressives um, because they don't want to get in crosshairs with the right. leaders. So they're sort of leading it to Pelosi and everyone to take care of it, hoping that they'll be defended and protected um, and supported financially uh, because theirs obviously are the districts that matter. And so um, they are obviously fully engaged um, behind the scenes, the Problem Solvers Caucus, the New Dems, you know, with what Manchin is doing. And they're aware of how, of the attempts to sort of bring, you know, shrink the bill and make it more sane. Um, but but I, 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 like I said, what's interesting is about how specifically vague Manchin is being. Right. And it does, it, it does, feed the narrative that he and cinema won't be specific, that they are holding the social welfare program hostage and won't be specific about it until and unless they get passage of the transportation bill, yeah. uh, the physical infrastructure bill. And I don't know if that's entirely true, but that is, you know, well, that's the progressive and, and, complaint. Yeah. And, and of course, then the progressives say, well, the, the moment, and I think Bernie Sanders actually said that this morning, that the moment we pass the bipartisan bill, we lose all of our leverage. Mm -hmm. um, and, and frankly, they don't trust um, Manchin, Cinema, Pelosi, others to give them what they want unless they do it. So they're gonna, they, they, will, they will, in fact, hold it hostage. I guess here's my question, though, because I, I, I know that there's a lot of pressure uh, on the, the Senate Democrats to end the filibuster, which they probably ought to have carve outs. But it, what is your sense? It, it, it's my sense that it's not just Manchin and Cinema that that there are other Democratic votes that 
have stayed below the radar screen that also would not go along with that? Yeah. Well, like I said, I think that there's a core group of, you know, five others or, or maybe okay, six who, who <clears throat> just can imagine what Mitch McConnell would do as majority leader in 2023 without the legislative filibuster. And that so they, in a sense, these two are just kind of taking the arrows for others. Yes. Okay. All right. So following through on our theme of what are they thinking? <laughs> okay. This is the easiest now. Because what is Donald Trump thinking? You had a column up over at Real <laughs> Clear Politics yesterday. Um, Trump admits the midterms are about him, not the GOP. Um, not not exactly, you know, new for us, but Do- Donald Trump has made it just abundantly clear and continues to that he really doesn't care about the party, does he? That that it's really all about him and his performance in Georgia was kind of a perfect encapsulation of that, wasn't it? It was amazing. It was so gratuitous and in your face. I wrote a piece for you guys in, I think, December Mm -hmm. called What If Trump Is Trying to Break the GOP? Not that he was going to break it because he's Trump. And unless you play a lot of Cats music, he's destructive, a bull in the china shop, that he is determined to break it because it serves his purpose. And and in, in on Saturday night in Perry, Georgia, he he just reveled in flirting with you know the idea that Stacey Abrams would be uh, a better choice in the end than Brian Kemp. Very subtle, knowing right, knowing that um, she's prepping a run for governor, and he has not found the challenger of his of his dreams to take on Brian Kemp because Doug Collins. Uh, the former congressman won't do it, and on and on. Herschel Walker is going to run for Senate. But, um, you know, as I point out in the piece, Georgia Republican officials were so furious that all they did was text the AJC's top political reporter with their laments, which were on background, and no one has said a thing. And Trump knows this. He can go on the John Frederick show. He can go wherever he wants and say, you know, these Republicans who voted against me on impeachment in the House, you know, I'm going to come and get them. They're even, you know, even a Democrat would be better in their district than them winning. And that means if my primary challenger of choice to David Valadeo or Peter Meyer or Liz Cheney or whoever doesn't win, Liz Cheney, not a swing district. You know what I'm saying? John Katko of New York. Um, Fred Upton of Michigan, if if I don't get my primary challenger, he is basically telling him now, I will go out and tell those voters, vote for the Democrat. So you wrote that, you know, as Trump is escalating this intra-party fight, um, which is, of course, that this membership fee in the Republican Party is backing the big lie. You point out that 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 membership fee has grown far more costly in just the last two weeks. We've learned, you know, Trump campaign itself had debunked election conspiracy theories that his allies were spreading. The fake audit of the Arizona results um, came up with absolutely nothing. Mike Lee and Lindsey Graham reviewed Trump's claims of election fraud and, um, you know, and basically, again, found that there was uh, no merit there. And Trump says he spent virtually no time with them. Um, And then we found that Trump and then Trump sent a letter, not one of his fake tweet press releases, asking Georgia Secretary of State to decertify the election and announce the true winner. Uh, And as you point out, so, I mean. What are what are congressional Republicans thinking, sitting, watching him throw their colleagues under the bus, behaving incre- increasingly erratically? We also found out about that John Eastman memo, which hasn't gotten enough attention. And so what are they thinking? What What is their calculation of why they are still joined at the hip with this guy? Oh, OK. So, Charlie, I didn't list the Eastman memo, although it's the most consequential and traumatizing development because these things um, reveal the John Eastman memo, people will be able to say, well, you know, everything was stopped. And in the end, the system held. Right. Um, So I'm with Kagan that what collectively we and cumulative we know now is that all of these strategies and tactics will be perfected. You can laugh at the ones that they used in 20 and the numb nuts that ran around like Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell, but really, Um, smarter people are coming in and perfecting the steel. Um, What we've learned about the Cyber Ninja fake audit results, what we've learned about court uh, documents revealing that the Trump campaign itself within two weeks of the election knew that these claims were bogus. And Senators Lee and Graham 
individually reviewed this stuff is that these now we know that these people have been lying um, all along and that there's new evidence that this wasn't true. The Eastman memo is, is a, is a t- terrible, s- scary tactic that's in a separate bucket. We know that these people have been, uh, that the Trump campaign um, under uh, deposition had to admit that they knew these were false, that Senator right. Lee and Graham, you know, Mike Lee, who holds himself up as like a potential Supreme Court justice, why didn't he come out on November 20th before Thanksgiving and tell us that? He did not. And then you have a a former president in September of 2021 saying, I I would like the the winner to be declared. Like, this is beyond crazy uncle and unhinged, like, you know, drunken man. This is like poor, poor loser. This is nine months later or 11 months later acting like a, I mean, this is so lunatic and no one will comment on it. Everyone's walking around like it's just another normal day, you know, just whistling yeah. tiny dancer and memory to, you know, make their day better and acting like it's normal, which is, it's just so indicative of the fact that they're willing to roll over and pretend this isn't happening. When you corner Republicans on the Kagan memo or any of this, this is yeah. what they will say. You know what? Trump's not going to be president again. He just thinks he is. It's all going to well, That's change. what they Trump said back in 2015. He's a real rock star. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, this, 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 I'm having the PTSD flashbacks. From- yeah. Being assured, don't worry about that. They, this, this won't actually happen. But do they basically? I mean, they're they're kind of held prisoner, right? Because they need the they need the Trumpist base to be all jazzed up to turn out in big numbers in in twenty twenty, right? They figure that if they don't royal the waters, that they're going to win the midterms anyway. So that you know they they feel like they're on the five yard line of getting back power as long as they don't you know you know make the you know Orange Versailles angry. Absolutely. They believe they can win the midterms um, handily. Uh, I think they will. Again, it might just be by a squeaker, uh, but it could be by a healthy margin. And they just don't want to rock the boat. They probably are beginning to notice that he's not going to stand up at rallies next fall and beg people to turn out on behalf of Congressman Snodgrass. But they think that it's still... Uh, diminishing returns to to say anything um, that could draw his ire. I, I think that Saturday, you know, is more alarming. I mean, th- yeah, than they expected this be. soon. You know that th- that he would start talking. I mean, he's this is now two times he said, "Let's just, you know, we'd rather have a Democrat." Um, I don't think that they entirely know where this is going, but they're in the same crouch they've been in. Uh, all these years, and um, they're just going to take the beating. I mean, that's that's the arrangement that they have, um, and he is going to tell the voters that they're going McConnell, to take the beating because that's the arrangement they have. Yes, yeah. sir. May I have some more? Can I have another one? But but really, think about how much this is going to um, complicate things for Republicans when he really ups the ante on McCarthy and McConnell yeah, hate in the that, months huh? to come and next summer and fall, because he will. And it's all about vengeance against them. That is going to be a real problem. And they haven't yet really d- decided how to deal with it, except to wish it'll just all go away. I just think they've lost the muscle memory of resistance. I think they've just simply forgotten how to push back. Yeah. It's just like, it's it's so much easier to go with the flow, to go with it. Even though they know that uh, that you know, no matter how loyal they are, at some point uh, he's gonna he'll throw them under the bus. But on 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 Saturday, it really was amazing when he's talking about, yeah, maybe Stacey Abrams would be better. I mean, <laughs> Donald Trump is saying that. I mean, that if that didn't send a a, a rocket flare across the bow of, of the GOP, I don't know what what would. A.B. Sutter, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. We always appreciate it. And it's been a particularly cheery show today, too. <laughs> I can always bring the doom anytime you want, Charlie. Thank you. Oh, we, we have plenty of that doom in-house. Trust, trust <laughs> me. We, we, don't, we, don't need to, we don't need to import it, but we appreciate your insight and your, and your knowledge. And thank everybody for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back tomorrow, and we'll do this all over again. <laughs>